Good morning, all. Uh, welcome to this info day that is dedicated to our recently published call on proximity and social economy in the industrial ecosystem. Uh, this is a call funded under the single market program. My name is Valentino Izzo. I'm program coordination manager at ISMEA. ISMEA is the executive agency of the commission that is mandated to, to manage this, this call. Uh, first, before starting, I would like to remind you some uh, housekeeping rules. So your microphone and camera are switched off by default. The meeting is recorded. If you do not wish your name to appear in the recording, please make sure to submit your question in Slido as anonymous. Once the slides and recording of this meeting will be available on the event page, you will receive an email to inform you. Uh, so the, there is also no chat. Uh, so for your questions, you will use Slido. You can already connect uh, to it, and so you can already start posing questions if you have any before uh, starting. To do so, you can join via the browser or the app and use the hashtag seed. So let's move to uh, to the agenda of today. The objective of this session is to provide you uh, information on the call uh, for proposal on its main uh, uh, rules, administrative and financial rules, on the background, the policy context, uh, and then, of course, uh, the, main, uh, the main objective is to uh, address your questions. So, as you see on, on, on the slide, we will have uh, question and answers uh, sessions after each speaker. Uh, this will uh, be to answer uh, questions uh, belonging to the speaker pertaining to, to the topic of the, of the presentations. And then we will have additional time at the end of the, uh, of, of the info day for the questions that we do not manage to, to answer before. Uh, for your information, we will uh, obviously try to address all questions uh, during this uh, info day. Uh, in case uh, we cannot succeed due to time constraints, we will uh, uh, collect uh, the questions you have posted in Slido and we will uh, publish uh, the, um, uh, an FAQ document on the funding and tender portal for the most frequently asked uh, questions. What we do not answer are questions that concern uh, individual cases. So please uh, bear this in mind. Uh, we answer, we address uh, questions that are aimed at clarifying the code text and its, uh, and its uh, uh, under, underneath uh, rules. But we, not, uh, we cannot answer questions, for example, on uh, specific cases of uh, eligibility of a specific uh, uh, consortium you have in mind, because I remind you that this is uh, a task that is uh, competence of an evaluation committee that is appointed for this and will uh, and will uh, um, assess the eligibility of each applicant uh, during the evaluation phase, not now. So we can now move uh, on. Uh, the first uh, speaker with us is Karen van der Porten, is policy officer in DG Group. Karen, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for, to the audience and the organizers uh, in the agency for um, organizing this info day. I'm uh, Karo van der Porten, indeed uh, policy officer at DG Grow. Um, together with colleagues in DG Employment, DG Grow is the main responsible um, uh, DG for social economy policy in general. Um, on the next slide, I will present you briefly the policy uh, background in relation to social economy, but first I will uh, introduce you in the more generic um, policy um, incentives uh, from the European Commission related to digital transition. So, of course, this uh, single market program is one of the main instruments to deliver on the industrial strategy, uh, which was identified initially in 2020. Um, in 2020, the Commission also um, submitted or presented uh, the renewed uh, SME strategy for a sustainable and digital Europe, of course, with a focus on supporting uh, SMEs uh, across uh, the EU. In 2021, the Communication uh, 2030 Digital Compass <clears throat> was uh, published, 
um, including the digital decade with of course the four main uh, angles of priority and, and, and goals. Uh, so digital skills, digitizing uh, public authorities, governments, and digitizing uh, businesses, and of course, uh, upgrading infrastructures, facilitating digitalization across the continent. Um, it gets more uh, important and, and more interesting for social economy, uh, specifically from 2021 onwards, because in 2021, um, there was a renewed industrial strategy because the, the initial industrial strategy of 2020 was, of course, not taking into account the effects of COVID-19. So actually it became, I will not say redundant, but there was a, a very intense overhaul necessary because our complete society and economy changed drastically and dramatically because of COVID-19. This was also the introduction of the, um, I hope in the meantime, well-known 14 industrial ecosystems, which you will see on the, the right uh, side uh, of the slide. And um, again, for social economy, a milestone uh, when it comes to European uh, policy making, because for the first time, proximity and social economy is recognized as a standalone industrial ecosystem and an industrial ecosystem with a lot of importance. Um, together uh, with uh, the other 13, such as tourism, such as um, agri, agro food, uh, retail, uh, renewable energies, and so on and so forth. So all the core industries are present in the industrial strategy, but for the first time, proximity and social economy is also recognized uh, as such. Um, of course, the digital decade policy program was one of the, the ways of, of monitoring and implementing the strategy and the, the, the ambitions of the 2021 digital compass. And I don't need to tell you that, of course, in 23, um, the European Year of Skills has a fair amount of attention to upskilling and reskilling when it comes to digitization. Um, this can be very advanced digital skills, but also inclusion related policies, inclusion in terms of digitization and uh, the way of giving digital skills to uh, vulnerable groups to lead them towards a labor market. I don't need to tell you that also their social economy has a very important um, uh, element or a very important role to play. On the next slide, you will see the role of social economy and the, the policy background um, as such. Um, of course, for those who are following social economy, uh, for some years at the European level, the Social Economy Action Plan is the milestone since the Social Business Initiative in 2011, so 10 years later, uh, on social economy policy. So we're a renewed engagement from the Commission, a very outspoken engagement from the Commission to promote social economy across the continent uh, following three uh, uh, main, uh, main axes. Um, in, in one of the main axes, there is a very clear focus on uh, maximizing the contribution of social economy to the green on the one hand, but also on the digital transition. This is, of course, very much linked with at the same time uh, released industrial policy strategy. And so the, the, the social economy action plan takes, of course, advantage of the recognition of the proximity and social economy ecosystem and to also promote uh, its transition in terms of green and digital. Uh, progress. Uh, last year, the Commission has already published a call to promote a green transition of social economy uh, uh, SMEs, and this call should be seen as a parallel initiative um, uh, to that call of last year. Um, it focuses, of course, mainly on the digital um, on the digital elements and the digital opportunities that lay within the ecosystem. And to that extent, the transition pathway for proximity and social economy is, of course. Um, the, 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 leading, the leading way, it gives uh, some kind of the introduction and the thematic opportunities that can be followed uh, within this call. The transition pathway is a jointly developed report, a jointly developed um, a policy initiative where 400 stakeholders from the social economy during one year uh, discussed, uh, created, um, gave feedback to the Commission on how to shape the digital um, action areas, the, di the digital needs, but also the opportunities, and that's a very important point where I will come back to um, later on of the social economy. 
Um, you can consult the transition pathway, of course, on our website. Um, the links are attached uh, under the hyperlink in the in the slides. Uh, you will find a report across uh, an, an, an executive summary. But what is most important are those seven action areas. You will see them here in the box on the slide. The seven action areas are also the backbone of this call in terms of thematic focus. So um, I will come back later to that. But in this call, um, applicants should choose at least one of the seven action areas to focus their project development uh, on. Of course, there can be more because there are a lot of overlaps. Uh, there are a lot of synergies between them, but it's important and it might help you also to develop um, the transition uh, to develop your project proposal if you're interested to have a look at the transition pathway because it might also give you a lot of, um, let's say, um, inspiration. Um, another element that I should highlight in this context is the way um, we are implementing now the transition pathway. Uh, one way to do this is, for example, this call. So the commission makes an engagement to uh, support the social economy ecosystem in guiding in developing this uh, digital transition along those seven action areas. But we also request some kind of engagement from the sector, from social economy actors themselves. This is what we call the call for pledges. So we call for engagement for pledges from the sector to come on, to come forward to show your leadership basically in the sector, but also to show your engagement in future to make this green or digital transition um, happen. Also on the website, you will see how you can make a call for pledge. It can be a very interesting link and it can also show your uh, true motivation to deliver uh, on this uh, call. Um, let's go to the to the call itself now after the policy background. Um, we try to make it relatively simple uh, and to uh, give it some kind of a logic uh, a structure with two uh, objectives. Um, the first primary objective, which is of course the call, um, uh, the, the core of this of this call is to strengthen digitization and capabilities of SMEs in the social economy. Um, if you would ask me, SMEs in the social economy is pretty simple. Huh? There is an SME definition um, uh, that is uh, that is available um, uh, in 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 uh, European uh, documents on the on the SME uh, strategy, and there is a, a definition, a sort of concept of what European Commission sees as social economy. So, therefore, the social economy action plan clearly defines what we see uh, as social economy. I think in the meantime that is. Uh, for for many stakeholders common sense but this is the way how you should uh, focus or how you should target let's say the the, the outside boundaries um, of our ecosystem um, the second uh, primary objective um, is strengthen the digital capacity of what we call enabling organizations um, why do we put emphasis on those enabling organizations and what are enabling organizations? It's because, of course, with the budget that we have within this call, which is um, uh, around uh, 8 million euros, we can, of course, not support any individual social economy SME or enterprise uh, across the EU. So we need um, organizations that can build capacity and then on their behalf can support their members um, their clients, uh, their beneficiaries. So this intermediate level is very important. Those type of organizations can, for example, be sector federations, uh, social economy sector federations. Those can be um, business support organizations, network federations. So organizations that are supporting, that have members that are social economy organizations or that are supporting social economy organizations as such in their um, in their uh, digitization uh, processes. So that's a, that's a very dual and important approach because we believe that those organizations are in the end a very important element um, to uh, assure continuity over time. Also, when this call ends to make sure that capacity on how to support the digitization of their SMEs uh, can be achieved. So that capacity should be uh, embedded in those organizations. A secondary objective, which we also want to, it's a sort of acknowledgement. Um, of the important role as social economy as pioneers in the digitization as well. We don't want to say only that social economy needs to be supported, that there is a need for capacity building, a need for skills building, a need for training. We also want to acknowledge that digital social innovation is something that is very much to the core of the ecosystem. That, uh, we have a vast, uh, let's say, uh, population of social economy organizations and support organizations that are promoting the, the practices within the, the concept of digital social innovation. So that means actually developing technology, using technology, using digital tools 
to answer societal uh, challenges, uh, to drive social innovation driven business models, et cetera, et cetera. So we still leave an opportunity for projects to include a, a focus on digital social innovation, but it's not a mandatory element. I will come back uh, to that later. Um, of course, this is a single market program. That means that this is a European uh, uh, driven uh, call. That means that there should be a transnational element, a sort of uh, learning effect between the different countries, between, between the different regions, even between local levels that are uh, identified across the EU and that will gather in a consortia. So this cross-sectoral cooperation, but also this, and for sure, this transnational cooperation is of course a crucial element uh, to develop a consortia answering um, this specific call. But my colleagues will come back uh, later uh, to that. The next slide will give you more uh, insight and some horizontal aspects to take in account. Um, the transnational element refers also, of course, to the different degrees of digital maturity that might be present in member uh, and consortia uh, partners. So this transfer of knowledge and this sharing of expertise for some, for example, uh, imagine that a, an, uh, a certain region where a very strong social economy support organization is present. There are many advanced on the digital field uh, social enterprises, but other regions that are also in the consortia present have really have to catch up. So this is a very ideal situation where there can be an exchange of knowledge and knowledge transfer um, uh, delivered. Um, also, when we are talking about technology, and you will also um, find that in the transition pathway, it's of course important to, to approach this from the values within the social economy. So meaning transparency, the element of solidarity, but also when using and developing uh, uh, technology or adapting technology, the affordability is of course very important. Adaptability is a key uh, process where the adaptability is also achievable for the average or very small uh, SMEs. And that also means accessibility, accessibility for businesses to get the tools, but also offering accessibility for the clients because many social economy organizations are supporting um, people uh, with a distance to the labor market, for example, or people who are socially excluded or have very low digital skills. So making the tools and the offer of the business as such uh, more accessible through uh, technology or through digital tools. This is another element that we, we hope to pursue a lot within this call and to also make uh, businesses aware about their role in that respect. Um, of course, and, and that is very much related also to the proximity element in the ecosystem that social economy is, is very much rooted to the territory, as we always say. So the local context can also be very um, interesting, but decisive. And this is also very much linked to the digital social innovation. Uh, where social innovations try to to uh, reply to put a response to a local uh, societal um, ecological even uh, and an economic uh, context uh, and this local context should be respected huh? so it's rarely um, possible to just transfer a social innovative um, response from one area to the other without adapting, without um, looking at the local context, without a proof of concept, without testing, etc. So this is very important to take into account when developing certain, um, let's say, project proposals, certainly when focusing on digital social innovation. And of course, the joint element is, is also very much embedded to the values of social economy. So um, uh, values like uh, cooperate, cooperation, uh, joint initiatives, also the public-private uh, partnerships to be developed and to really respect it within project. Those are things to, to consider very much uh, when uh, writing a project proposal. Um, the next slide, please. Um, it's when, when you would ask me uh, which uh, sub subset, uh, which uh, type of social economy organization should we offer? Well, that is that is very much up to you to decide. This is very much um, the, the identity of the project proposal. Um, we want to shift away um, a bit within uh, these type of calls to just serve the social economy as a whole. Um, because we see that within the social economy, there are very different types of organizations. There are very different sectors also present that maybe need very different answers. And we want to respect that uh, with this call. So, for example, you can focus on social economy organizations that are um, present in a very specific sectoral activity. For example, uh, recycling, social services, retail. I gave some examples uh, on the slide. So that's perfectly possible. 
Um, also, a specific type of social economy um, organization. Huh? When you look at the social economy action plan, you will see that uh, the four traditional families, huh, the cooperatives, foundations, mutual uh, societies, and non-profit associations are, of course, uh, traditionally uh, the, the, the core of the social economy, but there are also other ways of looking at it, for example, social enterprises, uh, but within the social enterprises or within certain subsets, you have other uh, types of organization, for example, the impact investment world, work integration, social enterprise. There are very, very different ways to position um, your organizational focus, and we really want to give the freedom to do so and to, to choose uh, as such. Um, a third element is also this geographic element, so the focus can be on a very specific region. It should not be cover a whole uh, a consortia member, should not, necess not necessarily cover, cover a whole uh, member state. It can be just one region within a member state. It can be even a, a city within a member state, so that is also very important. Um, um, to proclaim, and then it can also foster on a sort of cooperative cooperation at the local level. Uh, for example, the social economy cluster, territorial partnership, a certain digital uh, hub uh, existing on on social tech, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, a combination of all those matters um, that I mentioned is is uh, certainly possible. Why do we put so much emphasis? Because um, we want to assure you that you should not cover the whole social economy as such. Every concept that is present within the social economy, as it is defined in the social economy action plan, and to make to give yourself the freedom to really go and prioritize a certain subset, uh, as we say. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the thematic basis for the proposal, I already uh, explained to you that um, there are seven uh, thematic uh, action areas uh, and every proposal must clearly identify this in the proposal. Um, this should also be done in the eligibility checklist. Uh, my colleague Zoran will come back uh, later to that, but it's very crucial that you at least choose one of the seven as a thematic focus uh, in the proposal. I think that's pretty simple um, to understand, but as I said, there is, of course, uh, many uh, overlap. There are very link. Uh, there are a lot of links between the different elements. Um, if you, for example, focus on digital skills, uh, probably that goes hand in hand with access to technology. And that is, of course, something that speaks for itself. Um, but it's very important that you state this very clearly because that's also a way how to prove on, on, on for example, uh, how organizations are matching our transition pathway priorities with uh, effective project uh, proposals. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the scope of activities for the primary uh, objective. Um, so, of course, uh, uh, the capacity building is the core, um, but first we want you to map and do an assessment need uh, of the main digital needs of uh, the focus that you choose, the subject that you choose, the type of priorities, uh, priority social economy subsets that you identified. And so to also have you to make sure that you identify a clear target group, that you are also um, aware about the specific challenges, the opportunities, but also the innovative potentials that lay within uh, this target group, but also geographically uh, linked, for example. And second, and of course, that's the core fundament of the call, is direct support to uh, SMEs in the social economy, as well as their enabling organizations by setting up capacity building and training uh, activities and ad in address in that way the identified uh, needs, but also the opportunities uh, done in the mapping and needs assessment. Um, of course, uh, there is this local and regional uh, uh, dimension. And the, the core of the call should be, of course, on the local, regional or national level. Another aspect is the transnational link, uh, that you also have the opportunity to build these transnational links. Uh, training activities can also be organized at the transnational level. For example, if you have uh, five different enabling organizations in your consortia, of course, you need to also have sort of train the trainer activities. You need to test certain uh, training activities, certain uh, capacity building sessions. So those can be designed, for example, at the transnational level and then be further implemented uh, at the local, regional or national level. So that's why we put uh, so much emphasis um, on this. Um, a third element is, is this coaching, mentoring and advisory services. You will also have recognized for those who who uh, participated in the green call, and that is very similar. So on the one hand, we have the capacity building and training very specifically, but also supporting coaching, mentoring, and advisory, some kind of consultancy on how to drive the green 
uh, transition. This can be very basic, very hands-on, but it can also be pretty advanced. That's for you to decide, of course, depending on the priority uh, target group, depending on the focus of the, of the subject and also on the geographical uh, composition and sector level. Another element that is, uh, another uh, last element that is mandatory is providing financial support to uh, participants, so travel, accommodation, and uh, subsistence costs. That's the only, um, the only way we we offer in this uh, in this call uh, third party uh, financing, but my colleagues will also come back with more details uh, about that specific mandatory uh, activity in this regard. On the next slide, you will see the secondary objective, which and I I, I need to underline because this is an optional uh, aspect. Um, of course, uh, it's interesting to see, but you will not. Uh, it's it's not beneficial or not. It's really uh, for you to decide whether you want to include this uh, within your proposal or not. We put the option forward because we listen a lot to the stakeholders. They say we really have a lot of added value. We have a lot of uh, potential in developing and supporting digital social innovation, but others, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the interest to pursue. So therefore, we really leave this as a choice to you, but we didn't want to exclude it. So it's really to explore the potential, for example, of digital solutions from scratch to adapt them from one area to another to see and test uh, with, uh, of course, the known uh, service, de uh, service design techniques on how a certain uh, digital social innovation can pursue or support us, uh, the solution for a certain uh, social challenge. Within the call, you will see a few examples of activities that can fall under this uh, specific uh, uh, secondary objective. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here I listed a series and uh, be, be, be assured this is a non-exhaustive list of what type of concrete activities can be um, developed uh, within uh, the project proposals. Um, I will not go in detail. They all make much uh, sense. And as I said, I, I, I already referred, for example, train the trainer, matchmaking events, uh, mapping on good practices, workshops, very specific uh, technology oriented uh, training sessions. Um, sessions on, on how to adapt, for example, certain technologies to another circumstance when we are talking about digital social innovation and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I want to come back one last time on the transnational dimension because sometimes we get uh, some activity, uh, some questions here. So transnational activities can be developed to support uh, the design or setup of the mapping exercise. That's something where you can work on on transnational level to design the support packages. So the capacity building packages to to organize the training sessions to compose uh, the different training uh, methodologies, but also of course to create a cross uh, cross sectoral or cross um, uh, territorial transfer of digital social innovations. Um, the purpose is, of course, to create these regular feedback loops. Now, it can also be a, an input for the Commission, for ourselves, to know what is happening across the territory, what is implemented within the different projects, and to also uh, create this, this, this uh, feedback loop towards uh, policy uh, incentives. Um, so that's another thing uh, you should really uh, keep in mind when developing this transnational uh, dimension. Next slide, please. Um, so then we come to the, the uh, expected uh, impacts of the call. Um, yeah, it will not surprise. This is of course very much linked with what I already um, highlighted during uh, the, the the mandatory activities, uh, the expectations of the proposals. Uh, so uh, the call for proposals targets, of course, a series of outcomes that are very important for us to measure or to get to get an idea in what type of direction uh, projects are are developing. So uh, it makes a lot of sense that uh, the increased amount of digitally skilled workforce is, of course, very important. Uh, skills is also a priority uh, number seven of the action uh, of the action areas in the transition pathway and um, so of course this is something that we really would like to to, to see uh, improve thanks to the proposals um, overall improved knowledge and capacity when it comes to digitization we are talking in the social economy about um, a majority of, of very small uh, SMEs uh, so very small organizations so how will we manage to give them at least the basic uh, digital interface the basic digital tools very practical things, digital invoicing, uh, developing a proper website, uh, developing sometimes uh, e-sales, but also joint uh, e-sales in a platform, et cetera. So the, all those things can be very much uh, integrated in your call for proposal. 
I would I would give a good read at a call because we go way more in detail than we have the opportunity now here in the call on what type of uh, let's say digital support services can be developed. Uh, we give suggestions and also have a look at the transition pathway. I cannot. I cannot say it enough to to inspire you and also to make sure and that you understand also the political background of this uh, initiative. Uh, and that also links, of course, to uh, the increased use of new technologies and digital tools where appropriate. Huh? So we should not force also small enterprises to use digital tools they don't need. And that's also the the adaptation, the need assessment and the maturity that should be measured in the in the needs and the mapping uh, uh, phase of the projects to make sure what type of support you give to what type of social enterprise or social economy uh, as a meet to make sure that it's really appropriate and adapted to the circumstances. Um, and of course, this is an, a potential to uh, get uh, enhanced digital and social innovation capacity at a very local and, and uh, regional level. Um, the increased amount of, of technology partnerships, as I said, uh, developing trainings, developing um, uh, technology, uh, technology opportunities uh, through partnerships is usually way more cost efficient, certainly uh, within the social economy where there are not a lot of resources to invest in technology and digital tools. So um, putting partners together at a local level to invest together, for example, in certain infrastructures, this is something that is very interested and in which we would like to see how it emerges. And that, of course, delivers in a vibrant and varied uh, ecosystem of social enterprises also uh, entering the digital decade. Next slide, please. I will come um, close to the end because we uh, have listed a series of also measurable uh, impacts. Huh? So before it was more like the, uh, let's say the descriptive or the, the, the reasoning behind, uh, we have a certain set of indicators that are, um, that are set uh, forward. For example, the number of transnational capacity building activities organized uh, with at least four minimum uh, activities per year. So that's also very much linked to the third party financing and the travel cost, the number of national, regional or local capacity building sessions that are organized. So you see that we make a clear distinction. The number of staff and management volunteers and target groups in SMEs in the social economy that receive the training. So this is on the, the let's say the, the training receiver level, the number of staff management and social economy enabling and the enabling organizations that receive the training. So this is not on the SME, but on the enabling organization level. And then the number of coaching, mentoring, advisory services that are offered to individual SMEs. And last uh, but not least, the number of SMEs in social economy um, that received direct financial support uh, to uh, join uh, the international uh, activities. Um, be aware that there are a few overarching indicators from the single market program, which are also listed in the call, but uh, I didn't want to add them here because they are generic uh, for all uh, projects. And it also motivates you to really absorb uh, the call text in a, in a very um, intensive uh, manner. Um, the next slide, I think that's the end for me. Uh, if uh, there are some uh, questions, I'm very happy to support, to help, or to give further clarification. Thank you very much for now. Thank you very much, Karel. Thanks for this very comprehensive uh, presentation over the policy context, but also the transition pathways, the, uh, the, the call objective uh, and scope. Uh, we have uh, three more uh, minutes, so let's go to Slido. Uh, so we have I will start right away because I think I actually already answered this question. Yeah, you you answered quite uh... and during my uh, during my intervention. So uh, again, there is a definition at EU level of what is uh, to be considered an SME, and there is also uh, the Social Economy Action Plan, which conceptualizes very clearly. And and I would say this is also a historic. Uh, achievement at, at at European level, there is finally sort of agreement on on what we consider as social economy. So, um, if you don't know these uh, elements, it's uh, a firm uh, suggestion to have a look at those documents and to uh, make yourself familiar with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Very clear answer. Uh, we don't have uh, more questions on slide at the moment. Uh, I uh, remind you, uh, use the hashtag seeds, uh, join Slido to pose your questions. If you have any more questions on this presentation before we move on, last chance. 
Yes, we seems we might have one more question. So okay, let's take this one. Uh, what does social economy enabling organization mean? Um, Karel, uh, what, yeah, I'm still it, here. Um, so uh, to be, uh, actually, uh, this we also okay. You you also uh, explained in your presentation, and uh, I think we also have uh, already published an answer about this on the funding and the portal. Karel, I don't know if you. Yeah, that, that's actually what I also want to say. Um, I think it's pretty well explained in the call. I also try to explain it again um, in the um, in my presentation. So it's it's an intermediate organization. It's not a single SME. It's an organization that uh, acts, for example, as an incubator, um, business support organization, business federation, sector organization. A social economy membership uh, organization, uh, for example, on a certain, for example, uh, on the cooperatives, on the work integration, social enterprises, social enterprise federation, uh, all those type of organizations supporting or gathering or uh, a network uh, of social economy organizations that um, can transfer the knowledge, that can also keep the knowledge in house to. When the when the call ends, that can really build its own capacities to support their individual members and their individual clients uh, in the long run. That's that's the, the the intuition behind the role of the enabling uh, organizations. But again, in the call, it's pretty well explained what we uh, what we think about it. It's also a pretty open uh, uh, concept, but it's uh, it's for sure, for example, not a single uh, social economy organization. Thanks, and I see that uh, now more questions are popping up. Uh, let's take the last one, uh, uh, then the others uh, we will address them uh, in the last session of Q and A. So, what, what, are, the what key, are the key differences with, with the, the screening of SME school? Um, oh, that's. Uh, I think the the calls are pretty uh, parallel, to be honest. Um, you will, of course, spot some differences because the topic is different. But for example, the, the digital social innovation element is something that is, is of course, uh, different. Um, also, the third party financing, which is more a, tech, uh, a technique, a subsidy technique is also a difference. Um, but I would just suggest you, you have a, a very clear look at the call and discover yourself. Uh, that's also part of the job, of course. Yes. Thank you. Then uh, I suggest to move to the uh, to the next speaker uh, that will uh, uh, Zoran Stanisic uh, from uh, Ismea. He's the call coordinator, and we he will uh, present you. Uh, he will uh, bring us a bit more uh, into the the call uh, eligibility condition, administrative rules, and so on. So I leave the floor to Zoran. Uh, thank you very much, Valentino. Indeed, so my name is Zoran Stamenjic and I'm the call coordinator here at the ESMEA and for this call for proposals. Um, yes, I will give you an overview and general information on the call, uh, mostly in terms of process um, and different criteria, uh, starting with uh, with call basics. Um, so as um, Karel already mentioned, the call budget is um, 8 million and with this 8 million, we are looking to fund six to eight projects. Um, with um, um, grant amounts between 900,000 and 1.3 million. Um, the project duration should be between 24 and 36 months. And at the moment, the tentative start date is planned for um, September 2024. Um, here on the first slide, I also provide the link to the electronic, uh, to, the, to the page of the call on the funding and tenders portal, where you can then also reach the link um, for the submission, but I will say uh, more about it in the, in the next slides. Um, so this is an um, indicative call timeline. I mean, some, some dates are indicative, some are, are fixed. Um, so the call was published on the 14th September, and then uh, two weeks later, on the 29th of September, we have published a corrigendum. Um, corrigendum is basically, um, it's a very technical corrigendum, it, uh, and it concerns just um, one footnote, um, and it's due to the uh, amended commission decision uh, on the unit costs for travel, accommodation, and subsistence. Um, and my colleague Ala will say a bit uh, more later about uh, the unit costs. Um, the most important date for you, um, of course, is the one marked in red. It's the 21st of November 2023. Uh, 5 p.m. Um, uh, Central European time, which is a deadline for the submission of proposals. 
Um, I will mention it later, maybe more than one time. Please do not wait for the last um, minutes to submit um, to make sure that you don't have any issues, um, you know, from the IT point of view, uh, from your side, from our side. So make sure that you are ready uh, well before. So maybe it's good that you put uh, some internal deadline for you, uh, let's say 19 or 20 to, to submit. Um, then tentatively, the evaluation is planned between December uh, and March 2024. Um, and we look at then grant preparation between April and June 2024, um, and we um, plan to sign all grants, um, let's say, um, in, in June at the latest, and then, as mentioned before, the projects will start on, in September 2024. This is, um, this is a tentative planning as it stands now. Um, as mentioned before, um, the, the projects will be between 24 and 36 months, um, and what I would like to mention here as well, so that um, those projects that will last 24 months will have no interim payment while all others will have uh, one interim payment uh, but more on that um, my colleague Anna, um, will mention um, and then yes the the final reporting and final payment will come um, in september 2026 until uh, september 2027 depending on the length uh, on the duration of, of the projects um, before going into, into the process, I would quickly like to mention uh, different types of, of applicants and, and, and participants if you are selected. So let's say the core uh, type of, of participants are, are what we call beneficiaries and beneficiaries are the ones that um, sign the grant agreement um, and they receive EU money to, to implement the activities of the project and they must be um, registered and validated in the participant register. Um, I'm not going to go into details of and validation because um, after this presentation my colleague Karadu will, will explain in more detail uh, how to register and what we mean by, by validation. Then we have um, affiliated entities. These are entities linked to, to a beneficiary and with a link um, we mean a legal link or, or a capital link. Uh, they do not sign the grant agreement but they do receive EU funding so they also must be registered and validated. And one very important uh, element is that um, when we talk about the composition of the consortium, um, the affiliate entities do not count towards, um, towards this. Then we have the associated partners. They do not receive um, EU funding, but um, they anyway must be registered on the portal. Um, then we have uh, also subcontractors. Usually um, this is for the limited part of your project. It should never be for the core tasks. For example, you cannot hire subcontractors to do project management, and they should clearly be indicated um, in the application form. Um, there will be uh, in the template. There is a. It, it's clear clear where you have to indicate the the subcontracted activities. Um, and um, then we have also third parties giving in kind contributions. They are also not formal recipients of EU funding, but they can. Um, provide in-kind contributions uh, in some cases. Um, two important points to, to mention here is that the proposals must be submitted by a consortium of applicants. Um, and uh, that means that single applications from single organizations um, are not uh, accepted. Uh, and one applicant must be appointed as a coordinator of the consortium. And um, this coordinator will, um, among other things, also be in contact with us um, during the whole procedure, if necessary. Um, so this is the big picture. This is uh, the overview of the submission evaluation process. I will go into detail of, of each of this element in, in my uh, next slides. Um, so we have admissibility, uh, then we have eligibility, exclusion, um, capacity check, so financial and operational capacity. And then I will also talk about the, the evaluation procedure and uh, um, award criteria. So going through the admissibility requirements, so the, the submission is only electronic and it's via the, the funding and tenders portal. Um, on the next slide, I will give a bit more details about it. Uh, but the point is that you cannot submit in any other way than electronic. So you, we do not accept submission uh, by email uh, or by post or I don't know, in-person delivery. Um, and they must be sub so they must be submitted electronically and before the deadline of 21st of November, uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Um, they must be readable, accessible, and printable. Um, and as you will see already in the submission system, you can only um, upload PDFs. Um, and here uh, we mentioned specifically the detailed um, budget table. 
Um, so in, in the original form of, of the detail budget table is an Excel, uh, Excel file, um, which can sometimes prove tricky when, uh, submit, uh, when transforming, it, transforming it into PDF. So once you transform it, please make sure that um, all the information that you have put in Excel, uh, Excel version is also into, in, in PDF version. Um, application must application must be complete. So um, part A, it's completed online. I will say a bit more about what is in part A later. So it's from uh, it's it, uh, the applications consist of part A and and part B. Um, the core part of part B is a technical description of it, and then we have um, three annexes. Um, it's a detailed budget table, uh, list of previous key projects um, for the last four years, which is actually. Um, at the bottom of the template of the technical description, you will see there is a table uh, there for you to complete. And a very important, uh, you also need to upload the, the eligibility checklist, um, which is available for you to download from ISMEA's page uh, of the call. I provide a hyperlink here. Um, this template is not available from the submission system, you, so you absolutely need to go to the uh, today's mass page, uh, download the word version. Only the word version is available. Complete it and then upload it. You will see uh, it's it's quite uh, uh, straightforward. Um, and then indeed, if you wish to have even more information about the submission process, I invite you to read the online manual to which I provide the hyperlink on on the on the slide. Um, so electronic submission, um, yes. How, what you should do if you go to the page. Um, um, on the funding and tenders portal, of, uh, so the page of the call, you scroll down to the section called start submission and you click um, start submission and this will lead you to the submission system. There you will have to first complete the, the part A, which are administrative forms um, and they include the general information, including the proposals abstract, for example, and then some declarations that a coordinator must do on behalf of the consortium. Uh, you will also have to provide administrative data of participants um, and let's say a simplified version um, of the budget. Um, what is important is that this simplified version of the budget is um, consistent with the detailed budget that you will submit as an annex um, to part B. Um, in case there are discrepancies between the two budgets, uh, the, the one in part B, uh, part A um, will supersede the one on, in part B. Then um, in part B, so you, uh, part B basically is, is the, you have to upload um, um, a number of, of templates that are available in the submission system. Um, the core of your proposal is the technical description um, of it. Um, and important here is that this is limited to maximum 50 pages. So um, all pages that um, go beyond that will not be considered uh, by the evaluation committee. Um, so it's very important that you, you keep this in mind. Um, so this page is uh, this page limit refers only to the technical description and does not include annexes. So with annexes, you can have, of course, um, more pages uh, than 50. Uh, here, I would also like to say that make sure that you follow the instructions in the template clearly because you cannot simply reduce the font size and then uh, in that way again the uh, gain more text. Um, so there is clear instructions how you have to complete uh, uh, the technical description. Then we have the um, no, still. Uh, then we still have the the detailed budget table that you have to uh, upload as as an annex to Part B. Um, very important, I will mention also in the next slide, is that you download the correct template, and the correct template for this call ends with number ninety. So this is really really important that you use the correct template. Um, yes, list of previous projects, as I said uh, before already, is um, it's, it's a table that is as, at the bottom of the technical description uh, template. And then we have the what you still need to submit is the consortium eligibility checklist, which is available on, on, on the ISMAS page. Um, these are um, this is a, these are a few snips from the submission system. Um, so when you come in uh, in the submission system itself, I would recommend that you first click on download Part B templates. And here you can see indeed I mark uh, what needs to be uh, downloaded and then um, completed and, and uploaded. Um, the correct detailed budget table again ending with number ninety and the, the file name. And then uh, the template for the for the technical description, which um, for for application form part part B, it is very um, intuitive where you have to um, upload these two two files, 
um, they have to be in PDF as mentioned previously. Um, you for this call, CVs are not necessary, annual activity reports are, ne are not necessary, but what you still do have to upload is the consortium eligibility um, checklist. Um, so consortium eligibility checklist um, consists of two sections, uh, and the first section is the action area selection, um, as already Carl introduced before, so you need to select one um, or more of, of the seven um, action areas um, uh, in, in for your proposal. So it's important that you also not the only um, mention this selection in, in the technical description, but also that you select it in, in the eligibility checklist because this will uh, make our uh, life a bit easier. It's for our information, also for the statistics pur purposes. Um, and the second um, section of the checklist focuses on the eligibility. What you need to provide here is the, the list of, of applicants, uh, including the country they come from, and then the, the last, so the third and the fourth column from the left. Um, if you first, if you consider the, a certain applicant, a social economy enabling organization um, that acts on local, regional or, or national level, then, then you say yes. If this is not the case, you say no. And then the last column, uh, if you consider the, the respective applicant, a support organization active and at, at EU level, then you say yes. Um, if not, um, you say uh, no, of course. Uh, please do not forget to, to complete this checklist. It's, it's very important. Now we come to the, to the eligibility requirements. Um, first, we will focus um, on the eligibility requirements of, of applicants and then uh, on the eligibility requirements when it comes to the composition um, of the consortium. Um, so the, the applicants, um, beneficiaries and affiliate entities, they, they must be legal entities, um, either public or private bodies. Um, they must be established in an eligible country, which is um, all EU member states, um, Ukraine, um, and countries participating in the single market program. Uh, I'm not going to list all, all the countries that participate in the single market program. I suggest that you follow the hyperlink um, that is provided in the call and also uh, in, in this slide. Um, then the applicants must also be social economy enabling organizations um, that are um, operational at national, regional or local level, or be support organizations that are active at EU level and represent social economy entities. Um, so these are the two types of entities that, that are, they must be present in, in, the, in the consortium, um, but there are additional types of entities that can participate in the consortia, provided, of course, that they are legal entities and established in one of the eligible countries. Um, but I will say a word about it um, in the next slide. <clears throat> So eligibility requirements when it comes to the consortium uh, composition. So yes, indeed, the, the proposals must be submitted by a consortium of applicants. Um, and uh, here it's important that, as I mentioned before, the affiliate, affiliated entities do not count towards um, fulfilling um, the numbers, let's say, or the requirements of the consortium composition. So here we talk really about beneficiaries. Very important for you um, to remember. Um, so I will go bullet by bullet point. Um, first one is at least six independent entities, so beneficiaries uh, from at least three uh, different eligible countries. So um, minimum criteria, for example, this is that you would have, uh, let's say, uh, two independent entities from Belgium, two independent ent entities from the Netherlands, and two independent ent entities um, from Italy. This is how you would um, satisfy the first criterion under, under the first bullet point. The second bullet point is um, you need to have at least one social economy enabling organization per participating country um, in the consortium. Um, so the organizations that are operational either at national, regional or a local level. Um, if we keep our previous example, it means that you need to have one such economy from Belgium, uh, one such organization from, from Belgium one such organization from the Netherlands and one such organization um, from Italy. The last um, requirement as regards the composition of the consortium is that you will need to have at least one uh, and maximum two support organizations that are active at EU level and represent social economy entities. Um, 
what is also very important is um, the text that is next to the um, to the smaller light bulb here. I'm not going to read out the, the text because it's basically the, the, the copy paste from from the call itself. But it, what it basically means that um, support organizations that are active at EU level um, do not necessarily actively work on social economy in the country where they are registered. Uh, so they cannot be actually considered as social economy enabling organizations that are active at national, regional or, or local level. Um, so in that regard, please do pay special attention uh, to this requirement and make sure that you have enough um, social enabling organizations per participating country that are active at national, uh, regional or local level. It might sound a bit complicated, but it, it, it really is not once you read the call. But when it comes to this requirement, if, if I put it very, very, very simply, uh, don't mix the second and third uh, bullet point and, and you should be fine. Um, and as I said, so these are the minimum requirements when it comes to the um, composition of the um, of the consortium, but additional types of, of entities um, are encouraged uh, to participate in the consortia. So in addition to this minimum con composition, you can also have uh, um, different types of entities um, that are, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, legal entities and established in, um, in, in the eligible country that can then participate. Um, see, see the list of, of, of all these different types of entities in the section six of the code document. Um, then very quickly, what was actually already asked and, and answered by, by, by Karel, um, what we mean by the social economy enabling organization is uh, basically uh, are the organizations that are established in, in, in various forms that are listed here on the slide and also in the respective footnote in the call um, that provide support services to social economy entities at, at local, uh, regional or, or national level. Um, again, this is in, in the call in, in one of the footnotes. Um, very similarly, we, this is what we also mean by, by the organizations that are active at EU level. Um, yes, the difference is uh, that one are active at um, national, local or regional level and the organization active at EU level are active at EU level. Now, what we mean um, by active at um, EU, EU level is basically so when, when an organization um, has an overall mission, um, their scope of action and their activities uh, and the stakeholders they represent is uh, basically their main key is, is that they are on the level of, of EU. Um, so their, their overall mission is to support at EU level. Um, what we do not mean by active at EU level is if you have a, if you are a local organization or a national organization um, and you are involved in, in one uh, or a few EU projects, but your main activities are mainly um, focused on, on local or region or a national level, this we do not consider um, as a support organization active at EU level um, in the context of, of this call. <clears throat> then we move to the, to the financial capacity, which basically means that um, stable and sufficient resources are needed by beneficiaries to, to implement uh, the projects. And this, these checks are carried actually after the selection of projects um, during the grant preparation. So I will not go into um, detail on that, um, but basically the check is normally done for uh, for all beneficiaries and if, if affiliated uh, entities, if, if necessary, um, except for uh, public bodies and in case uh, where the individual requested grant um, is less than 60,000 um, euro. Um, yes, I provide an, um, a hyperlink to uh, so that uh, for more info on the financial capacity assessment where you can also if you are interested and if you want to do, you can do a self-check uh, of your financial capacity. You will find a link to the self-check um, there. Um, now we move to operational capacity and um, exclusion. Uh, so the operational capacity basically means that you have the skills and, and resources needed um, to successfully implement the, pro the project. And this will be assessed under the quality, um, one of the quality award criterion. I will get back to, uh, to this criterion later on. And it will be based on the staff profiles, uh, participants description and list of previous projects um, that uh, will be included in, um, in the technical description and in, in, in Annex 4 when it comes to list of previous projects. Again, CVs um, are not necessary in, in this case. Um, regarding the exclusion, yes, there are there are many exclusion grounds uh, that are listed in, in, in the call document, so in, I invite you to read those. These are, for example, bankruptcy, fraud um, and, and similar cases. So um, 
in case you were subject to, to one of those, you cannot participate. Um, what I would like to men mention is that uh, um, when du during the application um, in, in part A, you will need to provide a declaration uh, on your honor that you are not a subject to any exclusion grounds. Um, before going into the um, evaluation procedure and, and award criteria, I would like to recall a few mandatory elements that are really so that are really mandatory. Um, as, as mentioned before, the budget uh, of individual project projects. So the ground the, the grant amount should be between 900,000 and 1.3 million euro. Uh, the length of the project should normally be between 24 and 36 months. Uh, these are the four mandatory activities, which uh, Carl already outlined uh, very well before, so I'm not going to get into them again. Um, yes, and FSTP. So FSTP is uh, financial support to third parties. <clears throat> what is very important that um, within this call, um, the amount is limited to the maximum percent of 20% of, of your grant, um, which, for example, means if you ask for a grant of 1 million, the maximum amount that you can uh, allocate to FSTP uh, is 200,000. Um, um, yes, as already the name su suggests, this is for third parties, so it is uh, for those that are not part uh, of your consortia, um, so not for the project partners, and can be um, in this case, in, in the case of this call, uh, in the FSTP can, use, can be used only um, for contributions um, in, in the form of a lump sum, uh, to third parties selected to participate in the activities that are organized by the consortium. Then we also have a mandatory deliverable. Actually, it's the same deliverable that will be needed every six months. Uh, it's what we call um, a progress report. And um, in this report, we will actually not, we, we look, uh, we will provide a template uh, to those selected and we are really looking to provide something that is very, uh, very light. Uh, we do not foresee um, heavy reporting um, every six months, um, but mainly um, we look um, to see uh, the achievement of, of uh, key performance indicators that you will um, have in your projects. Um, and then there are also mandatory call indicators that uh, they all need to be covered as already Karel mentioned, and two of those indicators um, also have a mandatory minimum that needs to be um, achieved. Just one second. <clears throat> so going into the evaluation procedure, um, so the proposals will be only uh, evaluated um, against the award criteria if they pass the admissibility and eligibility check. Um, evaluation committee will assess all, all the applications, so from, from admissibility, eligibility, and then based on the award criteria, and create their ranking. And what is very important is that the, the committee will be assisted by independent external experts. What we mean by, by independent and external is that they are um, independent and external uh, of ISMEA and of the, uh, of the European Commission. Um, once the evaluation is done, um, all um, coordinators so will be informed about the, the, the evaluation result via a letter, um, and the successful proposals will be invited to, to grant agreement uh, preparations. Those that are not uh, successful will either be put on the reserve list or will be um, rejected. Um, more information about the evaluation procedure can be found in section uh, eight uh, of the call. So <clears throat> award criteria, as you can imagine, it's a very, it's very, very important mm -hmm. element uh, for you. So I invite you to read it really in detail um, in the call. It's, it, it has, there are four different um, criteria. So relevance is one, then two of them focus on quality and, and the fourth one um, on, on impact. Um, what you see here in, in the slide is, is a shortened version of the text that is available in, in the call. So again, please refer to the call, uh, not just to this slide, um, but very briefly going to, to each, each of them. So under the first criterion uh, relevance, we will be looking at the clarity and, and consistency of, of our project objectives and planning, and uh, the extent to which uh, the proposals match the call priorities um, and objectives. Um, we'll be looking at the EU context, transnational dimension, and potential, of course, border cooperation. Then quality, uh, two different um, criteria that, that uh, relate to quality. So first one is about project design um, and implementation. So here we'll be looking at the 
um, in the, in the intervention logic. So the links, links between uh, problems, needs, um, and, and solutions and activities that you will perform, uh, we will be performed. Uh, we will be then looking at the methodology uh, to implement the project, the time frame, cost effectiveness, and um, how you will deal with the financial uh, support to third parties. Um, the second criteria um, as regards the quality is, is about the project team and cooperation uh, arrangements. And here we will be looking at, at um, as, as the criteria suggests, as, as, as the, at the quality and expertise of the consortium and then project team. Um, we will be look at, looking at, at the different roles and contribution that different partners have and also at the procedures uh, and problem solving uh, mechanisms. Uh, finally, we will be, um, as regards the impact, we will be looking at the cred credibility, uh, um, ambition, um, expected long-term uh, long impact on different target groups. Uh, we'll be looking at the dissemination strategy, um, including communi communication, sustainability, um, and key, uh, key performance indicators. And again, please have a look at the, the call uh, text, so section nine of the call, um, on, the, on more details on the work criteria. Um, here on the table, uh, on the slide, you can see the, the minimum pass scores, so thresholds that you will need to pass, um, and you need to pass uh, all individual threshold and uh, the overall threshold uh, in order to yes, uh, be considered for, for funding. The overall threshold is 70 uh, points. Um, so coming close to, to the end of, of my presentation, um, so some tips and tricks. It has been said a couple of times already, first by Karel um, and, and also by myself. So read really carefully the code document, um, get to know the templates and annexes, everything you need to, to have to, to uh, that you need to submit. Have a look also the FAQs. So the FAQs, um, we already have a couple of questions published. Um, the FAQs are um, regularly updated and are published on the call uh, uh, call page on the funding and tenders portal. Um, the second um, suggestion would be indeed address all award criteria and their elements, as, as I mentioned, because you will be assessed against this award criteria and against nothing else. Um, structure the info correctly, uh, provide uh, details, uh, use quantification where, where pro when, when necessary, be, be consistent. With be consistent, what, what we mean is that, you know, if you're on page nine, say, um, something, do not say something else on, on page 15. Um, yes, and write in a reader-friendly manner. Uh, do not repeat what is what is in, in the call text because indeed we already know, know that and uh, so please focus on, on your project. Uh, that is particularly important um, in, in, in light of uh, the 50-page limit. Uh, before submitting, um, check the completeness of your proposal. Remember about the annexes, and um, especially we here mentioned the Annex 5, which is the eligibility consortium checklist, which, as mentioned before, is not available for download in the submission system, uh, but you have to download it from the ESMEAS page, uh, which hyperlink is provided on, on, um, in, in the slides. And again, uh, do not wait until the last minute uh, with the submission. Uh, you never know what uh, what issues uh, you can have. Um, second, um, yes, uh, build a detailed and complete budget. The templates will uh, will guide you in in that uh, respect. Um, what is important that um, the budget also must reflect the the technical description and activities. Um, for example, if you mention event um, or a training event A in your detailed budget, but this is not mentioned in the technical de the description, of course, there will be uh, questions, what, you know, what is this discrepancy? Uh, so make sure that the budget reflects uh, the technical description and, and vice versa. Um, yes, budgetary items, of course, they might be, must be necessary to, to execute the project. Um, the uh, clear division of tasks and res responsibilities is, is very important, uh, not only uh, basically for the proposal and, and, and for the evaluators, but also later for you. So um, for it, it's really necessary that um, for the successful implementation of, 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 of the project. And um, yeah, like that, I come to the to the next bullet point. Uh, remember that I mean, while we know that you will that you are writing this proposal now, but the, the projects will only start in a year. Um, but do be in mind that you will need to execute uh, what you submit now in practice if you are uh, selected because um, 
under this program, we evaluate the proposals as they are, so we do not improve them during grant agreement preparation, except for very minor things which will not have a major impact on your implementation. So, um, yes, to be successful, do set um, ambitious uh, but realistic goals already at this stage. <clears throat> And, and finally, um, so as you can imagine, um, a good consortium is also key to the success. So uh, you can find your partners um, via different ways. Um, uh, there is a partner search database on the funding and tenders portal um, on the call page on the, time, the funding and tenders portal. Um, we already saw that there are already a couple of requests um, uh, done. So you can uh, have a look there and also um, encode a request. Uh, you can also use the um, Enterprise Europe Network uh, database to which hyperlink we provide here. Um, needless to say, but we put it there anyway because we had um, cases where some partners were included uh, in, in the consortium without their consent. So do not include them in the consortium if you don't have the cons uh, consent. Um, and yes, if you have uh, a chance, we invite you also to consult experienced and former applicants um, and, and beneficiaries because I'm sure they can provide uh, valuable input uh, for you. Um, to get support, um, so on the on the IT related issues, uh, you need to um, contact IT help desk um, because we will not be able to help you with the IT issues. So we, again, we provide a hyperlink to the IT help desk, but this is a hyperlink to, to the funding and tenders portal. Um, all these hyperlinks are also available in the section 12 of the call. If you have general questions about um, your um, application, um, I invite you to read the online manual, which is also available uh, in the portal. Um, if you have non-IT related questions that um, and specific for this call, um, yes, send them to the email that is indicated um, on this slide and also in, in, the, in the call. And they must be sent by 14 November 2023 um, at the latest. And all these questions will be uh, replied in the FAQ sections uh, section on the on the call page uh, on the portal. Um, that is um, everything from my side. Um, I will uh, give the floor back to Valentina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zora. Um, so this was. Uh quite a lot of uh, information to be digested. So I would suggest to move on with the next speaker before uh, another Q&A session because the, the topics are quite linked. Uh, so uh, my suggestion is that we will uh, uh, give you some time to, to pose your questions in Slido and then we will address questions to Zora and the next speaker Radu uh, all together. So uh, the next speaker is Radu Sora, a team leader in the Central Validation uh, Service of the Commission, and will uh, uh, introduce us to the registration of participants. Radu, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. First of all, uh, good luck with your application from my side. Today, I, I have a very short presentation, and I will try to help you with a very little detail part of your submission. Um, we can move to the next slide, Paula. So, what we are going to, to see today very briefly, the registration of your entity in the funding and tenders portal. Then we are going to, to have a look at what could happen to you after the registration, what requests could come from the central validation service. And then what is very important for us, the communication aspect and tips and tricks in case there are issues on this side. And we will share also guidance documents on this topic for you to have and read and prepare if needed. So, registration of, an orga of your organization at proposal stage, exactly where you are now. You have two options in the funding and tender portal. Once you, this is a print screen from, from uh, the portal, there are basically two options for you available. The first one is to search for your organization in case this one is already registered. In this case, you need to search and then select the pick that you are going to find and use it at submission stage. If this pick is not available, no problem. You go for option two, the one on the right side of the screen, new registration. You register your organization from scratch. This process is very short. It takes five to seven minutes. You need to declare. Maybe next slide, Paola shows a bit what you need to do at registration phase. 
So you need to declare your the legal name of the entity you are uh, registering in the portal, and then you may have to be uh, ready to introduce certain details like the VAT number or the registration number. Be aware that all this data that you are going to declare with will be verified by the Center by the validation services at the later stage, and I will talk about it a bit later. But it's important to declare uh, accurate data if possible. If not, we are going to anyway double check everything based on supporting documents. Once you have the registration complete, once you, you complete the process, you will get a PIC number. And with this PIC number, you will be able to apply, submit proposal for grants and procurements using the same PIC number every time. We can move to the next one, Paula. Um, once you completed the registration, this slide shows a bit what is the validation process overview from our side. It means that once the PIC is available and you submitted a proposal or several proposals, what could come next for you is to have uh, to go through the verification process, and this is based on uh, supporting documents. Um, you are going to be contacted by us, and we are going to request documents depending on the status of your entity in the portal. In the same time, we are going to ask you to appoint a leader for your organization. I won't go into details of this part, but in the same time, in parallel, the financial capacity assessment could be started. This is not applicable for all of you. I think my colleague Zoran already explained a bit this point. Let's go to the next slide, Paula. So, once you register the PIC, this is the, the list of services that are uh, provided by the Center Validation Services, and all of them have in common the PIC as a common identifier. So, in your case, most probably we will have to check the legal existence and the legal status, and we will have to take care of the legal entity appointed representative, so appointment of the year. What else we do in our database, of course, it's to maintain all the data declared. All these peaks that are validated need to have maintenance, and then here we rely on the communication with you in order to update your profiles. We also, manage universal takeovers or mergers, or we like to call them, between entities. If two PICs are already registered and there is a merge between them, we need to um, make this visible in our database and also for our uh, uh, colleagues managing projects. This to, should be visible in their, in their project as well. On top of that, we create legal entities, we encode bank account files, financial capacity assessment already mentioned, we also perform, this is a new service that was added to our portfolio one or two years ago, the ownership control analysis, not relevant for you today. And SME and mid-cap status check, I think, not applicable uh, for you today. Let's go to the next one, legal validation. One of the biggest advantages of, um, of uh, legal validation for you, I would say, is the reusability. So once you are validated, once you go through all the process, your PIC is created, you submit all the documents. Um, the advantage is that uh, you, you won't need to go through this process again. You could reuse the same PIC uh, and apply again and again for any type of action you are interested to, to uh, collaborate with the European Commission, either grants or procurement. How we validate this, of course, we need to base ourselves on certain rules. And this is a link to our rules that I encourage you to, to read them once you finish the preparation of the project, of course. This is quite interesting document that will help you understand why we are requesting certain documents to you. And based on what rules we, we verify the existence of your entity. We validate all beneficiaries and affiliated entities. Associated partners are not concerned about this process for the moment. Let's go to the next slide, Paula. The type of documents that we may require, um, this is a sample of them. Of course, we could go and ask a few more, but these are the most common for private entities. We have the VAT extract and the registration extract. This should be recent. If there is no VAT, we need a proof of VAT exemption. There is the legal entity form. Basically, this is a, a template available 
in our document requested we need to fill in. For public entities, we have the law, decree, or decision, international organization, we need treaties, and statutes for non profit organizations. For bank account, again, there is a form that you need to, to fill in. Very simple, nothing complicated on this side. Let's go to the next slide, Paola. Communication. This is very important, and already at this stage, um, I would like to emphasize that uh, you need to uh, always communicate related to your PIC via the portal. And how this happens, you, you receive notifications via email. And what is very important, if you go now and create your PIC today, PIC, uh, uh, you need to, to ensure business continuity. What we recommend strongly is that the person who registers a PIC today or, I don't know, in the following days, appoints also a backup. This role, uh, all these picks that are created new are uh, created by default in a status that is called declared. And this status is very well accepted at submission phase. But the person who appears as um, behind and with the contact is called self-registrant. And this person has the role to, the, uh, to assign more colleagues from the same entity to have access to this peak in order to ensure business continuity in case we request documents on our side. This is a very important aspect and I will show you also what happens in case this access is lost on the next slide. Paula, yes, so there are two scenarios and these are very common, at submission and also after that, when we enter the gap, what happens if you lose access to your peak account? There are two scenarios in this, um, case for a non-valid PIC declared, what I was mentioning earlier, the solution is to register a new PIC. You need to register a new PIC. You communicate via the new PIC that you lost access to your previous PIC. And then what we will do is to link these two PICs and make sure the new one will appear in the project automatically. And uh, there's nothing to do on your side. We will request again documents for you and hopefully you will reply and we will complete the validation. What happens if you already have a valid PIC, you used it in previous uh, calls, but um, the person who was appointed as leader is no longer there. This scenario is a bit different because the leader needs to be validated by us but based on supporting documents. In this case, there is a link and it's also in the slides to a tool that we call leader recovery procedure where you will be able to reconnect with us and regenerate the lead appointment documents in order to go again to the process and recover the access to your tool. Then next slide, guidance documents, links on how to register, links again to the rules online manual and the legal notice on the funding and tenders portal. These are key documents that you should read, maybe not immediately now, but it's good that you have access to them and then if needed, go through them at a certain stage. I think that's it on my side. Paola, if there are questions, I think we will take care of them in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Shadow. Yes, we do have uh, questions, uh, at least uh, for, um, um, well, for both for, for Zoran and Radu, so please uh, stay with us. Let's see the questions. Uh, are the cri uh, criteria to be the coordinator of the consortium? No, no, there are, there are no specific criteria to, to, to be the coordinator of the consortium, no. Except, obviously, the eligibility of uh, applicants. Of course, it's the same as for all other applicants, but there is no specific uh, yeah. The support organization active at EU level can be the project coordinator of the projects. I think we replied uh, yes. already. So no specific requirement for the coordinator, so yes. We move to this, the other one. Uh, if we include in the consortium a research organization with a transversal role, it must be considered as local partner or not. Um, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Maybe Kyle, he. Uh... I think my understanding is that uh, the research organization has a horizontal role. Because we, we mentioned in the call, it must be uh, active at EU local. Uh, 
I think they mean with transversal, maybe transnational, but then the answer is indeed no. Uh, university is a, a local partner. Thanks, Juan. Um, is it possible to postpone the project submission deadline? Uh, indeed, with the web summit, summit a significant part of the European digital social ecosystem will be busy. Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. We we are aware of that, um, but we uh, we think we gave quite quite a long period, so we're confident that you will manage uh, even with the web summit. Thank you. Um, is it possible to include us as a subcontractor and independent entity based in UK? Yes, you can. Um, but again, be be aware that uh, subcontractors do not count towards the num to the towards the composition of the consortium. That's important. So national level SME development agency of the government providing development services to social enterprises can be considered as enabling organization of public authority. This um, it's again it's quite a sp specific case. I mean we are not assessing. I mentioned before we are not assessing eligibility, uh, and uh, it's only the task of the evaluation committee that is appointed to that. So uh, I think that. Uh, it's up to the applicants to demonstrate that they respect, they fulfill the eligibility requirements, and that therefore it will be up to the development agency to demonstrate that they do provide uh, support services to social enterprises. Move to the next one. Can we consider a region <coughs> development agency? This is the same question before, so we can skip it. There are some support organizations active at EU level that represent also no social economy entities are eligible to the project. Those, uh, those the, the, the enabling organizations that do not represent social economy entities. This is how I understand the question. Yes, I, I also understand it like this. Normally, no, but again, this is something, uh, you know, you have to, again, as, as Valentino said, demonstrate um that you do fulfill the eligibility criteria as presented in in the call and then the evaluation committee um will make its assessment and and, and decide uh, i'm not sure i understand i mean i understand the question but uh, yes if you don't represent social economy entities um, yeah. i don't know Karel, if you yeah it, this is also a case by case uh, evaluation uh, of course this is an organization that is um, accepted in a consortia, that's not an issue, but it um, does not mean that it requires the eligibility of having one uh, social economy intermediate or, or enabling an organization. So therefore, it's, it should be explicitly uh, supporting social economy organizations and also dominantly. Uh, but this needs to be checked uh, on, on your uh, defense or your uh, supportive documents, uh, I would say, as uh, Zoran and the colleagues already uh, explained. Thank you, Karen. So we move to the next one. For the same project, is this grant compatible with another grant that is not FSC? I don't know what it is. Uh, um, I so, and anyway, I mean, is this compatible with another uh, non cosme grant? Uh, I don't know what you mean compatible, but yeah, it's, if you have received previously, if I understand the question correctly, if you have previously received a grant, you can also receive it from from this group of proposals. I'm not sure if I uh, understand the question uh, correctly. I think yes, there is no compatibility issue. Uh, the only uh, limitation, obviously, is that uh, we we uh, cannot double fund the same uh, action. So. It will not be funded for the same actions funded under another program, but obviously, if you have a project that is compatible with another one, uh, there, there is no limitation in this sense. And uh, uh, the next one is the same question, so we, we can skip it. Uh, we are a legal entity, and as we have a peak, can we be validated by the central validation service before submitting the proposal? So not to compromise the consortium. Rob, this question is for you. Yeah. So in theory, yes, you can be validated, but this is not needed. So you are you are not going to compromise the consortium if your pick is not valid at the, this stage. 
Um, we validate only entities that are part of the gap. This is the priority. So we don't recommend to start the process and we, we don't have a workflow to start the process at this stage. Yeah, thank you, Rami. Um, so it seems we don't have more questions on these specific two presentations. We, we, I see that in, in Slido we have more, but uh, this is for other uh, presentations, so we will keep them for, uh, for later. I suggest then that we move to the next speaker, which is Alain Spunians, a financial officer at SMEA. So, Alain, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Alain. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I push on the wrong button. Um, so, uh, thank, thanks a lot, Valentino. My name is Anas Konyans, and I will talk uh, a bit uh, about the financial provisions of the call. Um, I am financial officer at ISMEA. <laughs> Uh, so first of all, as already told uh, by uh, by Zoran, uh, you will have to uh, submit uh, different kind of documents. From the financial point of view, uh, you will have to uh, uh, submit a few documents, which are normally uh, uh, three main documents, and you will have to fill in two uh, documents. The, those two documents are the summarized budget table, uh, which is also called the consolidated the consolidated table for the project and you will have to fill in a detailed budget table. The first one will, ha will have to be uh, filled in directly online and the detailed budget table, which uh, is the main document, uh, will have to be downloaded, filled in and then uploaded, as already said, under a, a PDF format. Uh, fa the financial data in both tables needs to match, of course, if not, uh, the summarized budget table takes precedence, as already said. And also, as already said, uh, at that stage, no paper at all will uh, have to be used. Uh, only uh, the, uh, the, submission, the submission will happen online. Next slide. So let's talk now about the detailed budget table. Um, as you will see, you will in fact receive uh, an Excel sheet which includes uh, five subsheets. Only the three of them will have to be submitted, the, the sheets three, four, and five. Um, what you will have to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to fill in, uh, so as I already told you, it's mainly two, uh, two uh, tables. Uh, the detailed budget table, uh, which has to be filled in per each member or affiliated entity. The, the general principle is, of course, if there are no costs to be declared, the, the, the boxes have to be left empty. This is quite evident. Next slide, please. So the detailed budget table is really uh, is very important for the for us from a financial point of view because it is really in this uh, table that you will have to declare uh, to make a, a, a detailed breakdown of your cost. You will have to declare only the eligible cost, and you will have also to make per uh, item. Uh, you, you will have to, to make declaration per item. So each uh, cost will have to be uh, detailed with some comments. Uh, so that we can uh, easily understand what is the purpose of the cost. Uh, you have, of, of course, to use your best estimates. Well, we are, of course, uh, talking about the budget, so, of course, you cannot be 100% uh, uh, sure of the, of the, the figures, but, uh, yes, uh, the best estimate, estimation would be, of course, uh, uh, interesting. You will see in the tables also that there are white cells. Those cells are the cells which need to be uh, to be filled in, and there are blue cells. The blue cells will uh, be uh, automatically uh, calculating the results of your uh, data. So the consolidated table participant is uh, is a second table. This table will be automatically calculated based on the the figures that you will have entered per participant in uh, the detailed budget table. So this is uh, this is just a, a table which will sum summary uh, all the, uh, uh, the all the detailed budget tables previously uh, filled in. 
And then the second page that you will have to fill in after the detailed budget table is the consolidated table per project, which, which uh, is really a summary of all the costs which, uh, which were, were budgeted. Uh, this table will have to be manually filled in by the coordinator. And this is a good test, in fact, to see that the, the data uh, that you will fill in here are matching the data which were previously um, uh, filled in by the, the, all the beneficiaries of the, the consortium in the detailed budget table. So let's talk now about the different cost category. categories. Sorry. Um, in the detailed budget table, you will see that you have on one side the project cost and on the other side the project income. So the project costs are the most, of course, important because those are the, 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 the costs, in fact, which, uh, which will be uh, eligible for, um, for your project. We have different categories. We have the personal costs, we have the subcontracting costs, the purchase costs, other, other cost categories, and the indirect costs. On the other side, we, you have, of course, the project income. The main one is, of course, the EU contribution. Uh, the EU contribution uh, will, uh, will provide a co-financing rate of 90% on all the, 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 the costs, except um, on the other cost category, which are the, uh, the financial support to third, party, to third parties, uh, which will be covered 100%. Uh, uh, you all also have the revenues and contribution by third parties. Here we are talking mainly about in-kind uh, contribution by third parties. Those costs should be declared but are not eligible because this is only a cost which are uh, in fact given as free by third parties. And then you have also in case of your own resources, which of course can be declared but are also not eligible, not taking part of the EU contribution. Let's talk about uh, first the personal costs. We have uh, four subcategories, the employees or equivalents, the natural persons under a direct contract, second persons and SME owners and natural person without a salary. The first category is the most common one. It is of course about uh, people having an employment contract or equivalent with the beneficiaries and people, those people are of course as assigned to the actions. Uh, the part of the costs which are eligible are the salaries, the social con security contributions, the taxes and other costs which are linked to the remuner remuneration. Some costs cannot be eligible, such as arbitrary bonuses, dividends, but also costs linked to sick leaves and holidays, which are of course not considered as uh, productive uh, days uh, linked to the actions. Um, for the calculation of the employees' costs, generally you would uh, present them in monthly rates for each person who will work on the actions. I say generally because we see from time to time that uh, some consortium declare them under uh, daily rates. Uh, this is uh, normally uh, uh, something which is, uh, uh, which is available in the detailed uh, budget table but we would advise you to uh, declare them in monthly rates. Um, for uh, one year, we consider that the maximum working days, taking into account the holidays, the weekends, uh, these maximum working days are 215 working days per year. After the, the employees, we have the cost for natural and second persons. Um, second persons are persons which are put at the disposal, at the disposal of uh, a beneficiary by a third party, which uh, a third party will send so, uh, a contract with um, the beneficiary. We have also natural person under direct contract, so not an employment contract, like freelance people or experts. It is important that for those two categories, uh, three main cate uh, three main conditions should be uh, fulfilled. There, there are, here there are four, but the three the three most important ones are, are the three first ones. It means that uh, the people working uh, should work on, should work under conditions similar condi uh, similar as employees. Uh, so they should be supervised and they should normally work in uh, the office in the premises of the beneficiary. 
Well, of course, now with the, the teleworking, which is taking more and more places, it's a bit uh, it's a bit different. But it means that they really have to, to work in the same condition as the, the normal employees. The cost of those people are not significant, significantly different from those from personnel performing similar tasks, and the work which is resulting still belongs to the beneficiary. The fourth condition is quite evident, but has to be also mentioned. It means that the, the cost declare amount solely to, to remuneration, remuneration taxation cost for the person in question. The third category are the costs for SME owners and natural persons. Uh, so uh, those persons, those uh, SME owners are not uh, receiving a salary. So the, the calculation of their cost will use uh, will be uh, will be done by uh, using unit cost. Uh, we use the, the unit cost is a daily rate. So it means that uh, you will have to declare the number of days that uh, that those people will work on the project on the actions, and the unit cost itself. So the, um, the this daily rate uh, can be. A uh, found in the uh, in a commission decision, uh, which will also be uh, part of the Annex 2A of the, the grant agreement, and this rate is uh, varying according to uh, the country uh, of the beneficiary. Natural person without any contract are uh, not eligible. <clears throat> Here you have an example of, uh, uh, it is a screenshot taken from a, de a detailed budget table. You can see that uh, you will have to declare uh, for, so for the personal cost, the, the cost per work package. And you will have to uh, define what is the profile, uh, what are the profiles of the, the respective uh, people. You, you will have to uh, define the, the, the rate which will be used, normally not monthly rate. And then the rate and the number, uh, the number of uh, months the, the 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 person will work on uh, the action. It is also uh, quite important to fill in um, the, the the last columns, uh, with, uh, which are mainly um, dedicated uh, to to say if the the the, the, the cost are, are just uh, working uh, just valid for one work package or can be also uh, valid for other work package and it's also quite interesting that you you make in the last column a description of the activities of the real activities which will be performed by the uh, respective person then we have a second cost categories category sorry which is the uh, subcontracting cost category in uh, this category, you, you will have to declare the purchase of goods, works, or services related to the project uh, to the project task. I, I think this is uh, important to, to put on evidence that you, you, you should not be confused with another uh, with another cost category, which is a cost category uh, declared on the purchase cost, which is called uh, other works, goods, and services. Um, because for subcontracting, the, the activities that will be subcontracted are really, really needed to, to be related to the, the action it, itself. For the other cost category, I will, I will say a bit later about it, uh, this is not the case. This, the, the, those activities, uh, the, those services are more uh, related to support to, to the action. So, um, what are the different uh, conditions uh, for subcontracting for sub cost to be eligible? So those costs, as already said, cannot be uh, cannot be linked to uh, core tasks. This, this can, they can also not be linked to uh, management or coordination tasks. They have obligatory to be performed by third parties, so not by a member, uh, by a beneficiary or an affiliated entities of uh, the, the the consortium. Those tasks, uh, those sorry, those costs should be described in Annex One. And also budgeted in Annex Two, which is the, so the, the second annex of the, the grant agreement. And if the, the, those costs represent more than 30% of the maximum grant amount, they should be ju justified in the application. So there is a filter, especially uh, foreseen for that. Um, those costs can only be uh, declared as actual costs because they, they are generally based on invoices, which are provided by the subcontractors. And they have to respect also the, the rules of best value for money and lowest price, and also the, the rule of not conflict of interest. 
Then we have a third uh, cost category, which is the purchase cost category. In this cost, you have three subcategories, the travel and subsistence and accommodation uh, cost, the, the equipment cost, and the other goods, works, and services costs, which I already a bit talked about. <clears throat> For the travel accommodation and subsistence costs, you have to keep in mind that those costs are only uh, valid for the personnel working on the actions, so not for uh, third parties. So it's important to, to keep in mind. Uh, they must be necessary under the actions, un under the action, and the calculation provided in the description uh, column of the of the detailed budget table has to uh, to find place. So this is in, very important that you you give a quite a detailed description of the travel, the, the number of, the number of people who will traveling, the destination. The destination is is important because no, this uh, travel uh, cost uh, should be uh, budgeted as unit cost, and those unit costs are, uh, in fact, you can find them in um, a commission decision from 2021, which was amended this year or so. Um, it means that uh, the, those unit costs are based on the kilometers that uh, that you will uh, that you will do during your journeys. Generally, though, so the, the, the general rule is to use unit cost. There are very few exceptions where, uh, uh, when, for example, the, the journeys are shorter than uh, the, the distance sorry, of the travels are, are shorter than 50 kilometers. In these only cases, you can still use actual cost because those uh, those distance, are, those very short distance, are not foreseen in the commission the commission decision. So here you can see uh, again an example of a screenshot taken from the detailed uh, budgetary uh, uh, table. Um, you can see that uh, per travel you you will have to uh, you, you can uh, detail the travel cost, the accommodation cost, and uh, the subsist subsist subsistence cost. Sorry, what is it to say? Uh, it's important so to, for each column to to use the unit cost, which is depending on the distance with, uh, of the travel. It can be international travels, national travels, or also uh, uh, travels between states in the uh, European Union. And uh, you have to put the number of unit costs. The number of unit costs will be the number of uh, people traveling. And again, you see, okay. Uh, thank you. Again, you see on the last column that you can uh, give description, as I just mentioned, uh, the, so a, a complete description of the, the respective travels. Thank you. No, and, and you have to go down. You have to go to the slides. It's normally the slides about equipment. Voilà, this is the. Uh, I know. Well, this is, this is sorry for this uh, this uh, technical issue. Um, thank you, Paula. Uh, so the in uh, the second sub uh, sub uh, category under purchase cost is the equipment uh, cost category. So it it may it may happen that you you will use some equipment for the good uh, execution of your grants. So for example, uh, computers. Those uh, equipment are eligible. So the cost for for, for using those uh, uh, those equipment are eligible if. Uh, the, in case the equipment is new or second hand, you can also um, make uh, declare renting and leasing costs of uh, of this equipment. The general rule is uh, the to use the depreci depreciation value of of the equipment. So um, the this is the 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 the, the value of the, the equipment which has to be declared in uh, the detailed budget table. So you have also to follow uh, your own uh, uh, accountancy rules and uh, all those equipment which will be declared in your uh, application should be recorded in the assets register of your accountancy. Then uh, we have a sec uh, next one, sorry, uh, which is uh, the cost category about other goods, works and services. As already uh, said, this cost category shouldn't be confused with subcontracting because it's, it goes a bit, it sounds a bit the same, but here we are only talking about goods, works, and services which, um, uh, which do not cover the implementation of the action itself. 
so which was uh, not the case of course for subcon subcontracting costs which were which were directly uh, linked to uh, the, the delivery the delivery and the execution of the action but the, the cost here should anyway be uh, necessary to car carry out the action so they, they, they are really uh, they should be really uh, supporting cost for example uh, consumables uh, dissemination cost also cost linked to the organization of events catering costs, renting of, uh, of a room for making um, an event. So this is the, those are quite a uh, so few examples of, of such costs. Those costs do not fall in any other cost category and they don't need to, to be indicated in Annex 1. Then we have another, uh, the last cost category, which is important, and uh, uh, Zoran already talked talk about this. It, it is, uh, it is the, the, the cost category financial support to third parties, F F FSTP, it's not FTSP, it's FSTP. Uh, this, uh, this cost category, those costs cannot be higher than 20% of the grant. And as already said, they are, uh, in contrary to, to the other uh, cost categories, they are reimbursed at 100% of the, the cost incurred. The other uh, cost category are reimbursed at 90%. Um, the maximum amount which can be uh, given to third parties cannot exceed 60,000 euro. So this is important to keep in mind. Um, the, the, service, the services provided uh, under this cost category cannot be provided through services of a consortium member or uh, an affiliated entity. This is, uh, so they should be only uh, done by uh, third parties. The intended purposes and the eligible channels are listed in the call document. So please be quite uh, uh, elaborating uh, while providing the proposal regarding the objectives, the conditions, and the modality which will be uh, which will be needed for uh, allowing the, those financial support to third parties. Um, last but not least, also of course the the different uh, the different um, uh, or should I say that the um, services should be uh, allocated should be allowed uh, via uh, full transparency, so no conflict of interest for actually and criteria predefined. Thank you. Uh, a last cost category, which is a bit uh, specific, it is it goes about the indirect cost category. This, uh, those costs are not directly linked to the actions implementation and are not and um, are not to be to attributed directly to it. So they are just running or operating costs, and those costs will be automatically uh, calculated by uh, the system at a flat rate of seven percent of the eligible uh, direct cost. Uh, so a few examples: stationary rent, stationary sorry, rent of the office, utilities, phone, phone calls, all those operating costs, which of course are also necessary for the good execution of uh, your uh, grant. No breakdown of those costs uh, are required. Uh, this is not fully uh, correct because in the, the no, this is uh, no, this is correct. Sorry, uh, it means that of course those costs will be just appeared in the the, the detailed budget table uh, as being automatically uh, calculated. Then you have specific cost eligibility, uh, the VIT, the value added taxes. Uh, generally, um, the when the VAT is non deductible. It would it, it should be eligible. It, it means that if you are not registered under the VAT system, and so in cases you are paying VAT and, and you are not paid back by the, the public authority, in that case only you can declare VAT. In the other cases, when you are registered on the VAT uh, system, uh, you cannot declare VAT. Uh, Kickoff meetings costs are eligible if the meeting uh, if the meetings are taking place after the project starting date, so are in fact taking place during the, the, the project duration. Uh, project websites, uh, for projects website, only communication costs are eligible. Costs for separate project websites are not eligible. And um, we have also the in-kind contribution costs. So those costs are uh, given for free by third parties. They can be declared, but they are not eligible, and that because they are just uh, they are just considered as cost neutral. 
Um, to finish, let's talk a bit about project income. So as already as already said, the EU contribution for uh, for the grant will be 100 100% for FSTP and 90% for all other cost categories. Uh, the project can sometimes uh, generate revenues. Uh, revenues in case of uh, revenues, you you will have to um, to respect the, the no profit rule uh, because the grants may not give a, a profit. So, uh, for example, surplus of revenue or, uh, addition to the EU grant uh, over cost will not be taken into consideration for the calculation of the the amount to to be paid. Um, so you can also have some uh, some other kind of revenues, like for example, um, uh, conference participant fees, uh, sales of books during conference, things like this. This can be, of course, uh, considered as, uh, as eligible, but uh, as long as the no profit rule uh, should apply. Uh, the second, the last. Uh, uh, Category of uh, resources, the own resources, just th those are the, the resources, of course, that you you would bring from yourself. Uh, can they, they can also be uh, declared, but uh, will also not be uh, considered, of course, of uh, eligible for refunding because the, 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 they have nothing to do with the EU contribution. Voilà, that's it. Thank you for um, listening. Thank you very much, Alain. So this was also quite very, very comprehensive presentation. We have about 25 minutes now um, before the, the, the end. So I was immediately jump on the questions as we will see many. Uh, so the floor is open to, to all questions. I please post your questions in slide or remind you. We start with the first, which is actually on, on for a land. So financial support to the parties is maximum 20%, which for 1.3 million means 260,000 euros. That is around, well, very precise uh, yeah. question. Yeah. This year, around 1,000 euros per third party, considering the minimum 250 entities to be targeted, correct? This uh, uh, this sounds indeed correct. Uh, so it means that then that of course in some cases the uh, uh, sixty thousand euro of course cannot would not be reached per per, uh, per beneficiary. But uh, this is this is uh, this is indeed correct. The 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 the, the threshold that I mentioned of sixty thousand of sixty thousand euro is is many a, a maximum threshold which is of course just given as an indication. In fact. If, 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 if I may, may add, indeed, I mean, it, it seems correct. Of course, you can, um, uh, that is in, in case you target the min, min, minimum 250 entities, you can target uh, more, uh, and then uh, the amount per third party uh, would, would, be, would be less, but indeed the same third party can participate in various activities. So this, what you're saying now, it could be, um, you know, they, they can go to different uh, activities. So you have to take this into, um, account um, also. Yeah. So to be seen on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. so exactly. You have added 250 as number of organization in the slide activities. So do we need to target 250 for this call? Is this the minimum to answer? So yes, I mean the the number of uh, 250. Uh, this is basically the number of SMEs in the social economy and social economy enabling organizations. So uh, together that need to receive the, the financial support to third parties. So this is the this is the minimum that we are talking here. It can be more, huh? it can be more. But you need to support at least 250 from the FST, uh, FSTP. Yes, Carol, do you want if, to if I if I may add this only relates to the third party. Huh? So this is uh, you should see this apart from the other activities huh? so that you don't think that the overall target of the call is to reach out to 250 organizations, which is, of course, relatively low. This is only the ones that are uh, supported by third party finance. So these are the ones that are actually um, uh, engaged in, in the international activity uh, of the, the project. Uh, yes. I hope that helps uh, to clarify. Indeed. So th this is really those that will receive the FSTP uh, support. That's that's in short. Uh, and yes, this is not at all the overall uh, target. Very clear, and I think this uh, answer also addresses the second one. 
Uh, so we can move to the next. Uh, um, so it's not clear. I'm sorry, the answers are changing. Uh, can we focus only on capacity building of enabling organizations in the project? Um, uh, this is for me, and to be honest, a bit of a worrying question because that means that my presentation was not super clear. Uh, but if you have a look, uh, certainly at page nine of the call, it's the answer is certainly no one. Huh? So the, it's the, there are two main focuses. One is the SME specifically, huh? so social economy organizations. But we also allow to strengthen the capacity of those enabling organizations. We didn't say that it's only the enabling organizations. Huh? When you read chapter nine scope of the activities, you it, it should become clear that the, the core of the activity should take place at the local level in supporting uh, the SMEs. We still allow also, and that's of course an, a second uh, objective of, of the call, to also strengthen the capacity of the enabling uh, organizations, as I explained, to also sustain the capacity over time after this call uh, is over. I hope that's clear, and, and it's a very important question um, uh, that you ask. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> wrong assumption, so I hope I make I make this clear now. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Now, uh, this is also, well, this is an individual case on eligibility, we, we addressed this, this type of questions already. So it's up to you to demonstrate that your uh, organization is uh, supporting uh, also organization active, active at your level. So yeah. maybe I, I can add, uh, because I understand the, the origin of the question, because it's an international nonprofit organization and the Belgian uh, ISBL, and I think in Luxembourg it also exists. Also in other countries, you have similar forms, but the legal form doesn't say anything about your activity. You can be perfectly an international ISBL and have only actually national focus on social economy, but okay, that would not be logic, but the legal form is not uh, a matter of, of, um, uh, of consideration for us to decide if you're international, if you have international activities. It can be an argument, but certainly not the only one. Thank you. Thank you. So and then uh, financial support to the parties can only finance travel and accommodation. Okay. Well, yes, yes, indeed, this is the case. Yes, and and subsistence in, in the form of a of a lump sum. And and what is important, it can support uh, travel, accommodation, and subsistence um, uh, in a form of a lump sum for activities that are organized by the consortium. For example, if you they organize, uh, if a consortium organizes a a training somewhere. Then you can bring these uh, third parties to uh, uh, by supporting them with the with the FSTP. So you cannot just give FSTP to for them to to, to participate in some random event, but it must be um, an activity event that is organized in the context of the project. Thank you. Uh, in the digital in social innovation, is it possible? Uh, um... I would say to, to do some software development activity or an existing digital tool to increase the potential to develop cross-border cooperation. Uh, I think this could be for Karel maybe and Karel or so on. We can't hear you, We are muted, Karel. Apologies, uh, exactly. That's very well understood what we aim um, by that. So it's adaptation to another context or to foster the international uh, potential of an already existing tool. I would really invite you to also consult because this question might also create confusion with, an, with, an, uh, with also the capacity building aspect in the FAQ uh, on the tender and funding portal. There is a very clear explanation on uh, development of software and digital uh, development. So, but indeed, uh, it's a it's a correct understanding um, of of how that is explained. But I would still welcome everybody to have a look at the fact to uh, FAQ to to see how uh, it is uh, uh, further uh, explained uh, besides the call. Thank you. Thank you. The coordinator of the consortium can be an affiliated entity or associated partner. I would say no. Uh, the coordinator is, is chosen between uh, among the beneficiaries. I remind you that affiliated entities uh, uh, and associated partners are very specific categories. So affiliated entities can uh, have a grant and are linked with the beneficiary, but they do not sign the grant. So obviously, they cannot be the coordinator who is who has to sign the grant with us. An associated partner 
is uh, without uh, is participating but is not receiving funding. So again, it cannot be coordinated. Can an applicant from Turkey uh, be coordinator partner? Uh, in the, uh, we said before, I think already that coordinator can be any eligible entity, uh, can, can be, so any eligible entity uh, among the beneficiaries can be a coordinator. Turkey uh, uh, is associated to the SP, so is an eligible country. So uh, if other conditions are respected, probably uh, it can be the coordinator. We move to the next one. The support organization active at EU level that represents social entities and also non social entities. Is it eligible? I think we addressed this question already. Before. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so do you want? Yeah, I would, I would welcome to have a, a good look at page 19 of the call document where this is also in the footnotes, um, pretty well explained what we understand there. Um, the, um, you should again prove that you are uh, eligible uh, under that, uh, uh, under such type of, uh, of party. It also depends what you understand under social entity, because we never speak about social entity. Um, in the context of this call, this is a call focusing on the social economy as a specific concept uh, related and explained in the social economy action plan. So again, make sure that also in terms of terminology, you are well aligned and that this is also um, retrievable in, in the argumentation that you bring for support organizations. Uh, support organizations should dominantly support social economy uh, entities or organizations, SMEs, um, and not just a few uh, in their portfolios. Also, the website, etc., uh, can be used to argue to argument that you offer explicitly and, and, and majorly uh, support services or network that you are a network organization for a social economy organization. I hope that this uh, that helps you to uh, understand this uh, this aspect. Thank you. So the next question is the maximum amount for uh, cascading funding equal to 20% of the overall budget. No, that would be maximum 20% of the grants, uh, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see and I'm nodding. So yes. uh, we move to the next question. Is the focus of the call therefore more on scalability effects through networks of SMEs and enabling organizations than on single SMEs? Maybe this is more for Karel. I kind of addressed uh, the duality. Uh, the, so the, the two primary objectives, first and foremost, SME support. But secondly, also by doing so, you also build the capacity within those enabling organizations. So the both are important, but the, do, the, 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 the real focus should indeed be on the local uh, activities developed and organized by enabling organizations, but addressing SME. So both are uh, uh, key here. So I also uh, motivate you to argument that very well in your project proposal that you understand this and how you will do that and what also the differences in approach are. Thank you. Yes, thanks, clear. So will the presentation recording be made available? Yes, we said it uh, in the beginning of the of the info day. Everything will be published on Ismea. You will also receive uh, an email about it when when the presentation and the recordings will be made available. Now, uh, is the 90% co-financing calculated per partner or on the total budget amounts? Okay. Yes, uh, the 90% the co-financing uh, uh, rate is calculated per, part, per partner, so not on the total budget amount. Okay, thank you. How many partners per country are recommended to include in the consortium? We don't uh, we fine. we don't we don't make any recommendation uh, here. Uh, this is pure to you to decide in terms of feasibility, um, what you think is most appropriate. Um, as I already introduced, and that's also very important. We don't require to cover a whole member state, so please keep that in mind. So one region in a member state uh, might be already enough. If you're, for example, uh, Luxembourg, uh, there will be. Uh, a quite big chance that you will work at a national level, while in France it might uh, target several regions, for example. So that uh, it's it's a, a pure example. Huh? So don't take uh, this as as the standard. It's for you to decide how many partners are feasible and what is the most workable uh, way to achieve uh, your uh, your ambitions in the proposal. 
Thank you. Uh, unless uh, Zoran wants to add something, of course. No, everything was said by Anna Valentina. So. Thank you. I see no more questions on Slido. Maybe you have a last chance if you want to to post questions on Slido. Otherwise, yes, on the screen you see again the QR code. So last call for you if you want to post questions now. Does not seem to be the case. So I'm I'm happy to to, to see that we uh, we managed to address all uh, all questions. Uh, before concluding, uh, in case you feel that we misunderstood some of the questions or uh, or uh, that we didn't sufficiently reply to, to your questions, please feel free to come back to us. Uh, you have the functional mailbox um, uh, on the, uh, to which you can address questions. Uh, yes, here on the screen uh, and also in the code text, obviously. So please feel free to, to come back to us. Uh, I remind you that so we do not uh, answer questions on specific cases of eligibility. Uh, conditions because this is done by a specific ad hoc uh, committee appointed for that. Um, we will, I remind you also that we will publish all the recording, the, the slides, and we will also collect the questions uh, posted on Slido and for the most frequently asked questions we will publish in the coming days. As soon as possible, we will publish uh, uh, an answer. So I think this is all for uh, for today so i thank you very much for your attention for your active participation and i wish you good luck bye, -bye.